just kind of get into the passage a little bit and start looking at it some. Um, so, Jeremiah 31, 31. Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand, bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, even though I had married them, says the Lord. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. So last week we talked about that second promise. There was two promises with this new covenant. The first one is he's going to write the law in the hearts, and the second one is all will know the Lord. So last week, kind of one of our big points was, you know, we don't want to be satisfied with our knowledge of God. We want to reach his level of satisfaction of his revelation of himself to us. So he is giving this covenant so that we can walk into it. He's giving this promise so that we can be pulled into him through it. So that was last week, the idea of knowing the Lord. So this week, we want to talk about that first part. What does that mean? I'll write their teaching within them, and, and I'll write it on their hearts. I'll put my teaching within them, and I'll write it on their hearts. And um, it's going to be pretty basic. Like, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about it. So here he's got a bunch of people, and... They were not keeping the law in front of them, the agreement that they made at Mount Sinai. So when you don't have it in front of you, you don't know what to do. And if you don't know what to do, then you can mess up easy, right? So that was a problem. And then secondly, um, they didn't really want to. <laughs> Even when they knew it, they didn't really want to do what they knew. So on the whole, the whole covenant system there was pretty broken. Because he was dealing with people who wouldn't keep it in front of them and didn't want to do it when they did keep it in front of them. And so his first big deal is he was going to cause, cause the people participating in the New Covenant um, to know the instructions intrinsically. They were going to know. It's going to be written on your heart. So it's like, think of a love song. Baby, I love for you comes from my heart to you. And so your love written on my heart, you know, I'm always thinking about you when I'm driving in my truck, you know, like we have this idea with maybe relationships or whatever, you always know where your lover is, um, so that's what he's actually promising to do with something called the Ten Commandments, <laughs> you know, so the law, it had Ten Commandments, and it had, you know, rules and stuff about how to have worship festivities, your festivities are seven days long, and everybody brings something to give. And you party, and you don't work. You do that four times a year. Hope you can handle being a Jew, <laughs> you know? But then there was some sober stuff, one day a year. Hey, all of you have been offering sacrifices for animals for your sins, but we're going to offer another sacrifice one day a year for all the ones you didn't get. That's actually kind of generous when you think about it. So that was called the Day of Atonement. So they have a special, kind of a sober day. And they had a big cow, and they killed him, and the priest went into the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkled blood on it. And the reason was, this is so that if you forgot about any sins, they're all covered over now. We can still party four times a year. Kind of a cool God, right? He's hip. So... He was solving that first problem of them not knowing the instructions with this new covenant by having those things, the idea of worship, the idea of taking care of sin, the idea of knowing what sin was, he was just going to write it inside of them. So they didn't have to reference a book. They referenced inside of them somehow. Okay? Um, but what about that second part? I mean, it's one thing for your kids to know what they need to do to be obedient. Another thing for them to be willing to do it. <laughs> you guys all know what I'm talking about. Okay? So, none of you or me in this room deal with that anyway. Is there clicks? What are you talking about? Okay? So, what he was going to do is, in Ezekiel, this was Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, they were contemporary prophets. And if you want to have a little extra proof that the Bible's not weird or quacked, here's a little supernatural piece for you. 
the Jeremiah writings all came from Judea, and the Ezekiel writings all came from Babylon, about 2,000 miles away, at the same time. So we just are now looking at Jeremiah 31, 31, and if you look at some of the little funny words, he says stuff like, I'll put my teaching within them right in their hearts, I will be their God, they will be my people, they'll all know me, I'll forgive their sins. Well, check out what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, at the same time, 2,000 miles away. I will sprinkle clean water on you, you'll be clean, I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. There's that cleanness. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. I'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'll place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. I'll, I'll make you obey the law. I'm going to cause for you to obey the law. Then you'll live in the land that I gave your fathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. The same features of the covenant spoken in Judea as spoken in Babylon at the same time. Never really trustworthy Bible, just so you know. So, but let's look at this part though, because this is the one where he's going to make them be willing to do the instructions. So when you have a child who knows what to do, but chooses to not do it, you're kind of done, right? I'm not allowed to talk about spanking. <laughs> no, I just did. So that's one solution. Or you got to get in there and change their heart somehow. you got to make them be able and willing and want to. Well, here was God with the whole nation of Israel, and they, even if they didn't know it, they didn't want to do it. So his solution was in Jeremiah 31, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, and I'm going to cause you to know what the stipulations of the covenant are. And then here in Ezekiel, I'm going to do three things. Someone tell me what three things he's going to do in verse 26, 27. New heart, new spirit, new statutes. Cause you. Uh, place my spirit. I'll give you a new heart, I'll give you a new spirit, and I'll put my spirit inside of your new heart and spirit. So, so when you get a new heart and a new spirit, your willingness is now changed. Your capacity to desire is alive. It's not a heart of stone, it's a heart of flesh. Like it beats and it wants to. Oh, it's completely black. Well, that says willing to do the instructions. Just trust me. It looks great. Anyway. But once your willingness is done, sometimes your ability still lacks. And that's what that third promise is. I'm going to make your insides change, new heart, new spirit, and then I'm going to put my willingness inside of you. My own spirit will go inside of you, and that will cause you to be able to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Then you'll go on the land I give your fathers, and big promise, you'll be my people, and I'll be your God. That is the same promise um, in kind of gray in the middle. I will be their God and they will be my people. The direct result in both of these two promises, the direct result of being able to have the ability to know and do the law was that I will be your God and you will be my people. This is, this is God's goal here. He wants to, whatever his goal is there, he wants it. Sounds kind of ambiguous. I'll be your God and you'll be my people. So we're going to talk about what that is so we can get it more pretty, particular. Pretty wonderful, isn't it? It's a pretty awesome thing. It's what God wants. He wants to have a group of people who are his people. Okay. So how then, when we came to the actual new covenant, we already talked about this. This is this. this is, Week number three, I think, of us talking about this or something like that. How will he do this new covenant? How will he write laws? How will he create willingness? What will be the new covenant? And the new covenant is... A person! Okay, so we talked about this. If I'm going to make a deal with any of you to, like, buy something or write up a bill of sale or make an agreement or... Something like that where we got to agree on it. We're going to write out paper. Well, God didn't write out paper. He handed you his son. 
This is my covenant to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Jesus, covenant Christ. And what he was doing in Isaiah 42, 6, is he's saying, I will keep you in a point to be a covenant for the people, a light to the nations. And then Jesus himself in Luke 22 says, this cup of red blood-colored wine is the new covenant established by my blood. So his very nature, his very person was given as the new covenant. So this <coughs> promise about God causing us to be able to obey, and this promise about God writing the knowledge of what to obey so that he could dwell with us and be our, our God, was going to be fulfilled in a person. So, and if you think about it, that's actually kind of brilliant. Because if you've got your kids, and you've got them to do their chores or whatever, if they're going to do their chores, let's say the chores are to, you know, clean out the gutters of the house. Hey, five year old. Get that ladder out there. Scrape it. You're clean. You know, the ability is really lacking. So you yourself want to be able to step in to cause them to be able to climb the ladder and cause them to be able to reach and cause them to be able to scrape out the gutter. So that's what God did. He wanted so bad for us to be able to dwell together, I'll be your God, you'll be my people, that he's like, you know what? Step aside and I'll do it. I'll send Jesus, I'll make him be inside of you, and then you can do it and we'll be good. Kind of fun. Kind of fun. So how do we get this scripturally? Go to Galatians 4 with me. Galatians 4. And in Galatians 4, we just have a really cool set of promises. Galatians 4, 4. <coughs> when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, Born under the law, he's comparing law to not law, as in Christ. And born under the law to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, or Father, so you no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Okay? And then, just to seal the deal about, yeah, but what about the law, Matt? Isn't, what are you saying, Jesus? Is he a substitute to the law? Galatians 5.18, it's up here if you want to turn to it, it's Galatians 5.18. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Okay, I'm going to get to that third one in a second. Let's just talk about the two that we've unwrapped. So here it is in Galatians, Paul's teaching, and he's explaining that God didn't want slaves, he wanted sons. He wanted sons who could intrinsically do the things that the father had in his household, in his family, what's it like to be in his family. And so God sent his Holy Spirit, and specifically what kind of Holy Spirit? The spirit of, of, the, of adoption, and I'm looking at the bold words. So the spirit of God who lives inside of the person participating in the new covenant, I will put my spirit in them, I'll cause them to it is specifically the spirit of Jesus. Specifically, the same spirit that dwelled in Jesus is the same spirit who moves into you or I who want to participate in God's new covenant with man. So Jesus himself is now going to be able to cause us to know what it means to please God so that we can dwell with him and host his presence. And he'll also cause us to be able to follow through. And um, Galatians 3.21 explains very specifically, is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. Very, very, very specific. When we are going to be involved in the new covenant, we need the life of God to be able to do it. When we want to live eternally with God, we need life eternal to be able to live eternal. Otherwise, you die, right? 
And so it is the life of Jesus who comes and lives inside of us, and he takes away what the law could not do and gives himself in place. When we didn't know what to do to be able to host God, Jesus comes in and becomes the um, knowledge. He becomes the, I'll use the word example, but that's not exactly precise. And then he also becomes the power, the impetus, the driving force for us to be able to. Okay, so this is, I'm kind of hammering at home, but that's the big point here, right? The point is, Jesus is amazing. <laughs> because he is all of these things that the new covenant is asking. So, like, let's just look at it again. <clears throat> this is a covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my teaching within them and write on their hearts. Correction. I'll put Jesus in you and write Jesus on your heart. I will be your God and you'll be my people. Jesus will be your God and you'll be Jesus' people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or brother, saying, Know the Lord, for the all know me, for the least of the greatest of them. I'll put Jesus inside of you and you'll know God because you'll be together inside of your person. And I'll forgive the wrongdoing and never again remember their sins. The point of the cross was to forgive sins by blood. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Jesus, for being the writing. Thanks, Jesus, for being the God. Thanks, Jesus, for helping us know God. Thanks, Jesus, for helping us not have sin anymore. And then Ezekiel 36 part comes in. Um, well, I didn't include that. I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit. I'm going to give the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of who? The Holy Spirit of the Son, of Jesus. Thanks, Jesus, for being the Holy Spirit that's also living inside of us. So do you wonder why we sing so many songs to Jesus on Sunday mornings? Because <laughs> he's worth singing to, singing about, thinking about, taking an hour on a Sunday, uh, taking minutes of your day. You know what I mean? Like he's worth it. He does all these things so that, and then this is the big really here, so that we can be God's people and that he can be our God. This is what God wants. <laughs> this is what God wants. So let's just take a half step back. Take a half step back. Alright. The goal is that phrase right there, because it comes up in both of them, both of those two passages from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. You'll be my people, I'll be your God. Okay, this is what God wants out of you. You and I, when we first maybe were introduced to who Jesus was, and we understood the cross and the resurrection, we said, wow, I just got to put my faith in Jesus for his death to cover my death and his life to give me life. Well, I'll put my belief in that. And then you got the benefit of it, and now you're here on Sunday morning, so that's cool. So immediately you're like, you know what? I get a good benefit. I get to go to heaven. So what 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 does God get out of this deal? <laughs> what does God get out of this deal? And this is what he gets. You'll be my people. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. And there's a very, very specific uh, picture that he has in mind of that that Ephesians 2 discusses. Bibles. Go to Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians 2. So here what we're going to do. Uh, my goal this morning is to pound these points over and over again so that we can build many wonderful structures on them. And in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11, we are going to see... Uh, we're going to kind of read it together, and I'm going to use interactive displays. And we're going to see if Paul explained everything that we've just been talking about last week and this week. So we're in Ephesians 2, 11. And so here it is. Ephesians 2, 11. Don't forget, okay, and we're looking, we're looking for what we talked about last two weeks. We want to be able to solve this Jewish promise. How come we're not involved? We want to solve that. We want to be able to look for the blood of Jesus. We want to look out for Jesus being the new covenant. We want to look out for the giving of the Spirit. We want to look out for knowing God. And we want to walk out, watch out for like how we'll be his people, he'll be our God. And then this idea of hosting God's presence, the dwelling of God among men. So in Ephesians 2, starting at 11, Paul just starts talking. Hey, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you didn't know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. 
Well, that's that idea of I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel with the house of Judah. So that was right away in Jeremiah 31. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What about the house of Canada? What about the house of America? And the answer is, no. God did not make a deal with the house of Canada. But if you remember back to Isaiah 49, I'm stretching your, your memories, I'm sorry. But Jesus says, I want my full reward. And the Father says, you're right. It is too small a thing that you would just receive the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will make you as a light to the nations. That's Isaiah 49. So here, Paul is saying, Messiah, you're not just going to save Israel. You're going to save the whole world. But it's going to come through a Jew. And we actually get to all become Jews. Mazel tov. Okay? In, in a spiritual way, we all become one in Christ, whose covenant promises came through the Jews. Okay? So that's, that's that part. Here's Paul teaching it. Okay, the next verse, 13. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Hooray! Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus. And what did Jesus say? This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. Okay, so the blood of Jesus becomes the unifying factor for Jews and Gentiles. All the nations come together as they drink the cup. Can there be world peace? Yes. Is the United Nations going to do it? They haven't yet. <laughs> well, not hope. But the real hope is the blood of Jesus that will bring all people together. Next verse, 14. Christ himself, notice how he's emphasizing that. Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated Jews and Gentiles. What does that remind you of? I will keep you and appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations. God's promise to the Messiah, you will be a light to the nations, you'll be a covenant to the people. You yourself, Messiah. What does Paul say? Christ himself, in his own body. So then, next verse. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations, the end of the Old Covenant. He made peace with Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people between two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. This is my body which is given for you. <clears throat> In my body, Jews and Gentiles, Canadians, Americans, Africans, everybody becomes one again. In myself. I am the new covenant <clears throat> between God and man. Okay? Then verse 17. He brought this good news of peace to you, Gentiles, who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. They had the promises given to them. Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done for us. Well, that's Ezekiel. I will place my Spirit within you, you will be my people, and I will be your God. And so the after we get into the body of Christ, we've drunk the cup and we've eaten the bread and we put our faith in this Jewish Jesus, then we are now given a new heart, a new spirit, and we are given the Holy Spirit of Jesus. And by that Holy Spirit, we now, what is that saying, Bold? We can now come to the Father. Now, that's verse 18. Now, as in the goal the aim for which all of these things, all of this expenditure of life and planning and Jewish nation through Abraham and all this stuff was so that, verse 18, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Okay, so we come into the New Covenant. Jesus is the New Covenant. Benefit. And then... Wrapping up to verse 19 here. 
So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. And he uses a bunch of analogies like family and others. Together we're his house, built on the foundation of the prophets and apostles. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We're carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling, where God lives by his spirit. I will place my spirit within you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Jeremiah says it, Ezekiel says it. Actually, if you read Jeremiah and Isaiah, it says that a lot. That phrase gets said a lot. <laughs> it's definitely the goal. <laughs> okay? I'll place my spirit within you. You remember to believe in God. Then let's just look at verse 19 and 22 again. You Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're now, look at these terms he uses. You're citizens along with God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together we are his house, built with a foundation of apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus. And we're carefully joined together to become a holy temple. And we're being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. He's using all these different analogies. They kind of mean the same thing. But they're just, he's saying over and over again, you're part of a group of people, family, house, temple, citizenry. You're part of a group of people who together, who together, let me say this again, who together are being made into a dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. Also, a little risky for our individuality. <laughs> now, I wrote this down, so I'm not going to offend anybody here by saying this, because I wrote this down. Okay. There is an, I'll, I'll use the term spirit. There is a spirit of individualism in our Western nations that says, me and God have our thing. We don't need church. We don't need any of that. We don't need those hypocrites. I'm good. Can I tell you now why that is not pleasing to God? God did not send Jesus to purchase humanity so he and one person could have one little thing together. He wants a group of citizens of holy people. He wants a family. He wants a household built on Jesus. He wants a temple, a holy dwelling for him with Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. He doesn't want a bunch of onesies and twosies all over the planet. He wants one big happy family. <laughs> Which just makes sense, too. I'm with you. <laughs> I would too. And 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 that's my intention. We don't do that. <laughs> okay. Here, here's here's the big why. Okay. Let's let's cover this a couple practical points. Um, God God gave us this new covenant through Jesus because we needed it, right? You got an eternal, infinite being. You don't really need anything. But, but he desired to display himself, and so he made a, a creation that could actually understand himself. We have the capacity to know God, and no other creature has that. We talked about that. And so we ourselves needed this new covenant, so he designed it so that we could have access to him. Okay? And um, the goal that he wanted to have was something that I don't know if there's a way to actually explain but that's why Paul prays in Ephesians 1 and in Ephesians 3, just pray that you would know the unknowable. Because that's the only way to know the unknowable, is to actually have yourself pointed to God and say, God, help me to know the unknowable. So if it's unknowable, guess what? It's unteachable. <laughs> but, but it can be talked about to the degree of creating hunger for each person to then desire to ask God, help me to know what your meaning of, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. What does this mean that we're going to be a holy temple? And we get some great scriptural clues. But um, I want to grab two really big, easy ones that we can take home right away. And the first one is this idea of, I'm just going to call it 100%, 100%. 
And, and so here you have God. He's calling out to people for this new covenant. And he's extending Jesus. God's completely extended himself. He's taken the, the, the precious jewel of heaven and handed him off to, well, murderers first, and then us. And, and he's handing out everything of heaven. So he's evacuated heaven. Jesus. It's awesome. And so then when he says, hey, I want you to <coughs> give up everything and come follow me. We're like, don't you think that's a lot? Shouldn't it be like half of my life goes to you and half of my life goes to me? And God's like, well, I just gave all of my life. And now you only, so, so a quarter. <laughs> this is bad math. No, it's 100%, 100%. He's going to give us 100% of heaven, 100% of the kingdom of heaven, 100% of Jesus, 100% of his spirit, 100% of his life, 100% of his dwelling. So, in a fair exchange... All he wants back is 100%. Okay? This, this works in salvation. So I'm talking about salvation, I'm talking about discipleship, I'm talking about what it means to follow the Lord every week and every day, and, and all that stuff. Um, but it, it also has to deal with how a relationship works. So I need an equally tall person, like Ben, to come up here, and this is, this is, this is, uh, this is also my marriage tip, because that's what you need from somebody who's been married for three and a half years. <laughs> so, marriage tips. Okay? So, what I'm going to do, just kind of get ready. Okay? Oh, no. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to stick my hands up, and I'm going to fall. <laughs> okay? Alright. That's pretty good. Okay. So, but if I completely fall, who's got all my weight? Ben. Right. Okay. Now, Ben, your turn. I'm for, I'm stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's a hundred percent of him, and kind of me, but it's awkward, right? At the same time. That's not so bad, is it? That's not so bad. Not so hard. Okay, and it works. So if you give a hundred percent, I give a hundred percent at the same time. Hey, it, it kind of like it works, right? Thank you, Ben. You're really good. But I'm just neither of you, dude. You don't have church. <laughs> okay? You don't have a marriage either. Okay, this is, this is just, this is God's principles that work everywhere. It just works everywhere. It doesn't work with little kids because they are giving 100% or 0% and you're, they're cute. <laughs> we like little kids because they're fun. Useless. <laughs> but we love them because we were once one, right? So, so the idea is this is this is how God's church works. This is how God's marriage works. This is how healthy relationships work. Is when you give yourself over to somebody, it works if they give themselves completely back. Okay. If you completely watch out for their needs and pretty much don't really take care of yourself. You're almost like, oh man, who's going to take care of me? Well, the person you're leaning on. You're going to give all of yourself, and they're going to give all of themselves, and it's going to work because both of you committed to, to do that. Okay? The, the, the problem lies in, obviously, when people give 100% and the other side doesn't, then there are unmet needs and unexpected desires, and you know what I mean? Problems come in, and the marriage books start to be bought, and all that stuff. And, and so this is God's demonstration of how he treats relationships. And when he gives himself 100%, he does want 100% back. Because that's how it works healthy. And that's when it's fun. That's when it's intimate. And that's when it's dynamic. And that's when things are more than just you being bored alone. You know? And so that's the beauty of church now, right? So church. So when we're talking about, um, like if I give myself all you guys you know, then you guys give all yourselves back to me, right? And it works. So, so it, this works across any dynamic, any resource. Um, how you spend your relational moments. So, like a lot of times, like, well, I just need time for myself. Yes, you do with the Lord. And then when you're done with that, raise them kids. You know, <laughs> or give to that body of Christ, those people. Give yourself away. Give yourself away. Give yourself away. Give yourself away. 
Give yourself away. No, you don't have enough. But I will place my spirit inside of you. I will give Jesus my son inside of you. Do you think Jesus was busy for three and a half years? Did he spend a lot of time with his father? Yes. And then the moment he was done with his father, he did whatever, he did whatever that day did. You know? And that's what he taught his disciples to do. And we're the fruit of those disciples, right? It's like this is an amazing principle because it requires trust. <laughs> and the moment it requires trust, it sounds like it's biblical. Because we've got to trust that if I give myself completely over to someone, that they'll give themselves completely back. But if they do, then hey, it's great. You don't? Well, you're still following God's stuff. And that's what he said in Matthew 6.33. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You can give yourself up. Because then he'll take care of you. He'll be back. The other side of this um, <coughs> is the dwelling place of God. And this is, when, when you've got a group of people who are doing that, giving themselves totally over to God in worship, giving themselves totally over to God in serving the needs of the people, giving themselves totally over to God in like, desiring to obey God, and listen to God, and hear for his voice, just like Jesus did, and make judgment calls, just like he did. He didn't make judgment calls. He listened for the Father to make judgment calls. He listened for the Father to teach him what to say. You know, like, when, when you've got a group of people doing this, um, what comes out of that is the dwelling place of God. And... And the dwelling place of God is actually an idea that uh, I do want us to spend some time looking into the scriptures of. But I'm going to tell you, it's kind of crazy. It's crazy. The idea of God wanting to inhabit a group of people all at once who want him to 